everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar series here at Origo. Uh, my name is Corey Norton. I'm part of our sales leadership um, at Origo. Um, and first off, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us for the first webinar of our 2023 webinar series. We're, we're very excited about it. Uh, for a little bit of background on Origo, for the last 20 years, we've provided capital owners an end-to-end -end solution to solve for the complexities that come along with things like capital planning and the construction process. And to kick off our 20th year webinar series, we're going to be discussing how agencies are working within increasing fiscal restraints while having access to fewer resources. Uh, we're joined by our expert panelists who will be covering topics like trends we've seen with inflation impacting capital program delivery, financial constraints agencies may face when planning and executing their program, and how technology such as workflow automation, financial controls, and mobile access can promote transparency and accountability. A uh, few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. And this webinar will be recorded and will provide the participants of the webinar with the recording as well as all the slides that we go over today. Uh, if you do have questions as we're going through the webinar, uh, please submit those to the webinar via the Q&A chat box and we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. If we can't get to all of the questions during the available time, we'll make sure to get you an answer, answer via email. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our expert panelists for today. So first, we're joined by Deputy Secretary and Chief Engineer of Delaware Department of Transportation, Shante Hastings. Uh, Shante has worked with DelDOT since graduating from the University of Delaware in 2000 with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. She is responsible for implementation of the department's $650 million annual capital transportation program uh, and delivered in part with her, uh, her team of 450 staff statewide. She also serves as the secretary's designee on national policy issues and is the department's liaison with the Federal Highway Administration. We are also joined by capital planning and project consulting professional Kayla Hines. Kayla joins us with over five years of experience in portfolio planning and project management in the public sector. Uh, most recently, she served as the lead for new facility development for King County Metro Transit in Seattle. Um, Kayla and her team developed GIS modeling software applications for the operator comfort station portfolio and led Metro's facilities planning project, evaluating existing and near and long-term organizational capacity and capital needs, including implementation strategies to achieve zero carbon, increased service levels, and equity and social justice strategic goals. Uh, finally, we're joined by our senior marketing manager here at Oregon, Stephanie Pedroza, who I'll be passing over to to get us kicked off. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon, and I want to welcome everyone in our audience from Maya, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And thank you to our panelists for agreeing to do this panel discussion. And I'm really excited to kick off this webinar series with this particular topic that was requested by many public agencies from our last webinar. And we've noticed that one of the biggest challenges that many agencies are facing right now is how to maximize their current funds to deliver capital programs. And we already know capital projects are already complex enough as it is and adding limiting factors such as inflation and supply chain issues impacting your current budgets. And we're also seeing construction labor shortages and not being able to hire the right talent quickly enough to keep your capital programs on track and running smoothly we definitely have a lot to uncover in this webinar, so I really look forward to it. And before we get started, we are going to launch a quick poll. So, Corey, I'll let you take over. Absolutely. We would, we would love to learn a little bit more about who we have joining us today. So if you could um, just kind of click the, the option that best applies to the organization you're, that, that best describes the organization that you're, uh, you're joining us from here today. We'll give a couple minutes for everybody to, uh, to go ahead and make a selection. And I really want to see who's joining us and help you enjoy this discussion. Give me a couple 
couple more seconds. We're about 50%, so we'll share. Awesome. Oh, so majority are with roads and bridges. We have a couple of water and wastewater, a couple of people with transit and other. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. And we want to know which of the following best describes your role. So if you can take a moment to submit, are you a project manager? Are you in capital planning and finance, an engineer, consultant, administration, or, not, or, administration, or if none of those apply, you can put other. But take a moment to answer the next poll question, please. Give it a couple more seconds. All right. So, oh, majority are project managers, a couple of people with capital planning and finance. We have several engineers and administration. So it's a pretty good mix of a little bit of everything. Well, once again, welcome everybody, and we'll move on with the discussion. And before we get started, I wanted to give you know, a little bit of information about what the current state of inflation is in our country as we speak. And I think we're all very aware that cost of everything has been skyrocketing from food to cost of gas to just cost of like even Ubers and just everything in our day-to-day -day life is skyrocketing because this is the highest that we've seen inflation in the last four decades. And it definitely has impacted our national's capital program delivery because a lot of materials are going up and it's making it difficult for agencies to obtain these materials, but not just that, complete the current projects that they have in line because the prices to complete these pro or programs are rising. But on the bright side, we did see that inflation did drop in December, meaning we're kind of headed in the right direction. And in August, inflation reduction or inflation reduction act was signed to approve our nation's infrastructure. So overall, we're headed in the right direction, but obviously right now we need to figure out what are we doing to, with our capital funds to actually improve our capital program delivery. And now I'll open it up with our panel discussion. And I'll start with you, Shantae. Can you kind of share what trends you've seen in the transportation and infrastructure industry that has impact, or how your capital program delivery has been impacted with inflation. Sure, happy to do so. And thank you so much for having uh, me today. Um, yes, I mean, a lot of what's on this slide in the previous slide is what we're seeing. Um, what, so, you know, seeing, especially last year, seeing a lot of bids coming in higher um, than anticipated. We also had the, uh, the issue of projects that were already in construction our contractors having to deal with the higher prices and them coming back to us wanting you know some additional compensation in the way that our specifications read that's actually not uh not the way that we do business and so having to kind of deal with those situations um supply chain you know having uh things like signal poles um taking 30 weeks of, of lead time and so having to make adjustments and uh you know, our team did a great job of looking, especially at the supply chain issues that that we knew would affect a lot of our projects even this year and trying to be proactive in, uh, you know, doing advanced ordering so that things could be in uh, in stock by the time that we needed them. Um, we have instituted a policy as of last year, uh, probably around the springtime when we started seeing a lot of the bids coming in high. Um, I basically told the teams that they needed to go back and redo any estimates that were more than a month or two old. Um, and so before they were bidding, um, obviously the, the project cost is what it is, but being able to, uh, you know, have a more realistic engineer's estimate to compare to the low apparent bid versus an outdated estimate 
um, was really important to me um, to see. And so we've had to make some tough decisions, and I'll, I'll talk about that in some of the later slides, um, about making adjustments for the, the issues with both inflation and supply chain. But we're, we're seeing all of it in Delaware. Yeah, no, it's definitely affecting everyone. And I'll pass the question over to you, Kayla. What have you seen in King County Metro Transit? How has inflation affected capital program delivery on your end? Um, absolutely. Um, of course, we're all dealing with the uncertainty of supply chain and labor shortage issues. So um, looking to um, help provide more certainty to our capital program delivery, um, we're looking at methods of project delivery, such as working with partnerships um, with other agencies uh, and also um, design build delivery methodology. No, definitely. And I think we need to readjust those estimates. And I guess, Shantae, here's the question. Now that you have to go back and redo all those bids and estimates, how much longer is it taking to redo all of those bids and estimates when you go back? Uh, so the team, uh, you know, I don't think it's taking a ton of time. They're really having to go in and adjust the unit prices. And we, we have a system that kind of uh, compiles and you can uh, pick different time frames to say in the last six months would have been the average bids prices for this item. So it's not taking a ton of time, but it is another step step that they need to do. But it's giving us good information going into bidding to know kind of, hey, how much are we above what we had originally funded for the project? And if a contractor is coming in even significantly over that adjusted estimate, are we going to need to reject bids? And I can tell you, we did reject a few bids last year. Um, because they were just so out of whack with what we had budgeted and, uh, um, you know, with the value, if you will, of the project that we just couldn't move forward with some of those things. And I think I was reading an article and it was saying, you know, we are going to have to just keep in mind that some projects aren't going to get delivered. And that's just kind of the reality, but we still have to move forward. It's not like we can pause. So we'll head on to the next slide and I'll pass it over to Shante. She's gonna share a couple of facts about Dell Dot. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to set the stage about uh, Delaware because many people don't know a lot about it. Some people have never been there. Um, and so we always start all of our presentations off with our mission statement to provide excellence in transportation for every trip, every mode, every dollar and every one. And that's really important because that drives a lot of our decisions. Um, so Delaware is a small state. We just topped over a million uh, in population as of the last sentence since, since this woohoo. Um, we own, operate, and maintain nearly 90% of the public roads in the state. So you go from an interstate all the way down to a neighborhood road, and we are owning and operating and maintaining them all. And a lot of people treat them equally, um, despite the, the uh, difference in, say, traffic volumes, for instance. Uh, we also manage uh, DMV as well as our transit arm, DTC. So our budget also uh, covers those, those types of activities. Um, we've used technology in a variety, um, especially on the DMV and DTC side to try and drive down costs. Um, we have about a billion dollar annual budget, um, just a little bit over that, um, with approximately 625 to 50 million um, going to capital projects, programs, and initiatives. And those capital projects aren't just your traditional transportation improvements that you see um, on the road and adjacent to the road, but it's facilities projects. Um, we're doing uh, maintenance contracts to do, you know, contract out work that we just don't have our uh, workforce to do, um, materials for in-house work, those types of things also are part of our capital project. And we even do uh, projects in those neighborhoods um, that are funded by uh, legislators. And so that also is part of our capital program. Awesome. Well, thanks for all those details. And it's nice to know about other agencies, especially Delaware, like you said, it's place that not a lot of people really know about and didn't realize how small it was. So now we'll go over onto our next slide and I'll start with you, Kayla. What are some planning constraints that you've seen um, at the transit level that kind of prevent you from running your capital program deliveries? Um, of course, the biggest issue with planning is that there are many unknowns and um, fortunately you can do your can't plan for unknowns, but you can do your best to help mitigate for the unknowns. So um, trying to work with our constraints, um, which also include not only maintaining our current assets, 
um, but also um, how our future service levels um, will impact our capital planning needs on our facility sides. So um, working with many unknowns and doing the best to capture those risk items for the near term and long term and help um, identify potential solutions and strategies to mitigate those risk items within our capital planning program. Awesome. And Shante, can you kind of share some of the planning constraints that you've seen at Delaware when it comes to capital program delivery? Sure, happy to. Uh, so I think the biggest strain on it, as Kayla mentioned, is that uncertainty, um, whether it be the supply chain, what the cost of things are going to be, trying to make sure that our projects are aligned with our you know, top goals. So safety is our number one goal within Delaware. Um, last year was our deadliest, tied for our deadliest year since we've been recording uh, fatal crashes. So um, 165 deaths on our roadways last year. And so, and it's, you know, been increasing over the last few years. And so we've got to make, you know, different decisions and trying to deliver those safety projects in a faster uh, manner so that we can affect change. Um, focusing on state of good repair. And, uh, you know, those projects are a little bit easier to do in a lot of cases because they're pretty straightforward in uh, scope and purpose and need. Um, and, you know, typically most people don't care about things like, oh, you're, you know, repaving a road or, you know, rebuilding a bridge kind of in its existing configuration. They care a lot more about the projects where we're adding, you know, doing corridor long projects that impact hundreds of residents. And those projects take longer to deliver because we are, you know, trying to be responsive to the public and making sure that we're having, you know, an adequate amount of public workshops, giving enough time for right of way negotiations. And those things are really hard to plan out in terms of timeframes. Um, we also have a ton of projects that are affected by utility uh, relocation uh, issues. And the utility companies are also faced with developer projects where they're actually getting paid to relocate their facilities versus our projects where a lot of times it's at their cost. And so we have actually been looking at, um, right now our capital transportation plan that we post for everyone uh, lays out all of the different phases of a project and gives kind of these false expectations about what year something is going to happen. And with all of those things combined, we're really taking a hard look at saying, okay, we can tell people when we're going to start the design process and we can give them our, you know, if everything goes great, here's when we would acquire a right of way. Here's when we would begin construction, but kind of putting those hard and fast, um, we're probably going to be pulling back on that because there is so much uncertainty for a variety of different reasons. Um, we haven't experienced a ton of labor shortage uh, within the state. Um, because we're small, we have obviously in-state uh, contractors that do our work, but we also have contractors that come from Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey um, to work on our projects as well. So we haven't seen a ton of uh, labor shortages. Now we have seen where you know a given contractor is bidding on multiple projects, gets them awarded, and now there's the uh, collaboration between projects because the paving crew, the one paving crew they have is needed on both projects kind of at the same time and trying to work through issues uh, like that with them. But that's, that's what's going on uh, in Delaware for the most part as it comes to planning constraints. Yeah, and I think uncertainty is something that we're never going to run away from. And it's one of those things that the public, you want an answer right now. And kind of how you said, you give them an unrealistic expectation of when the project's going to be over. But now working in the industry long enough, I know it can take years for a project to complete. Like you have that five-year plan, but that five-year plan can run into seven years, 10 years, 20 years. So it's definitely, I guess, engaging with your community and just setting those expectations as the projects go along. Um, so I'll run it over to the next slide. And next, we're going to talk about maximizing capital funds, which is definitely something that a lot of, I know, our audience really wants to focus on. How can we make use of funds? I know the IIJ bill passed and we thought we were gonna have an influx of funds, but now with inflation going high, with supply chain issues, everything is going higher. So what can agencies do now to make better use of those funds and keep those projects running? And Shante, I'll start with you on that. Sure, Sue, so I, I think there's a, a few things that I would share as I kind of looked at the bullets for this one and also some kind of maybe special things that we're doing in Delaware. So I definitely think 
uh, taking, you know, your mission and vision and tying it to your projects and making sure that there's that alignment is really important. Um, I also think collaboration and working with your various partners. So um, in, we have three counties in Delaware uh, and our southernmost county is booming. Uh, basically, it's a it's a beach uh, community for, for a large uh, percentage of it. And so we have an influx of folks who have second homes here, tons of development. And uh, we haven't really been able to keep pace with our projects as the development is occurring. Um, and so uh, in partnership with the uh, county government, we uh, came up with a process for them to actually advance us some funding uh, for projects that are in the in our capital plan um, so that they could be pulled forward from a pro from a schedule standpoint. Um, so we have one project that's underway now where basically we weren't supposed to start design, I want to say until maybe fiscal year 25 or 26. And because of this advanced funding that they're giving us, it will now be in construction in those years when it was supposed to you know, start design. Um, we will pay them back. Um, and so it would we're, the payback schedule is basically what where we had it in the capital transportation plan. That's where we would then pay them back. Um, but that's just kind of one unique thing that uh, in, in working with them and them, you know, pushing for how can we get things done faster? Well, if you give me the money, I can do it a little bit faster. This was pre-bill, um, but that was uh, one great technique. We're going after a ton of grants, um, both uh, on the, you know, transportation side, if you will, as well as transit um, in, in, able, uh, in order to be able to do things on the transit side, um, you know, looking at zero emission uh, bus purchases. And we have been successful um, in every, I think, grant application that we've done for that um, in getting both buses as well as being able to build uh, facilities um, that, uh, you know, support them in terms of having solar power. Uh, we're creating a microgrid. Uh, so doing different uh, different types of grant uh, opportunities like that. Um, let me think if there's anything else. And then the only other thing is uh, we have the ability to uh, uh, obtain uh, toll credits uh, from federal highways when we do work on our toll roads at our cost. And so we've also made sure to kind of maximize those opportunities, which provide some additional funding uh, for capital projects moving forward. And Kayla, I'll pass it over to you. What have you seen your agency do to maximize funds at the transit level? Yeah, um, as Shante mentioned, um, partnership opportunities um, and also identifying grant opportunities. So a lot of times when um, grants are made available, available, there's a very short window to get your project documentation ready and prepared um, and uh, submit it off to grant uh, to the grant um, at hand. So we were sure and to start drafting those applications to look ahead and see um, what resources we would need and how we can um, apply for grant funding so that when it becomes available, we're able to. Um, and then also um, partnership opportunities and better understanding what um, agencies are doing um, your bias to see if there's um, an opportunity to move up a project that we um, have identified that needs to be done to a um, higher timeline as well. Yeah, and I think I've been hearing that a lot and I think I read that a lot that partnership opportunities it's what's going to help move your projects a lot faster but also maximize your funds and I don't know if you guys can kind of touch clearly more on partnership um, collaboration, but how is your agency currently collaborating with your current partners to get all of those projects completed? And either Shantae or Kayla can chime I'll in. I'll jump in. Uh, so, you know, we have a variety of partners, I, I think, across the state um, that play a, a, a diff different roles um, within our projects. Um, I think that this one of the... Uh, one of the partners that we don't often traditionally think of as a partner is our development community. They are getting a, a lot of our work done um, as they're putting in these new developments, whether it be residential or commercial. You know, we're working with them to upgrade roads that otherwise would be maybe 50 years from now upgraded. And so trying to work with them within reason, um, we created a transportation or I shouldn't say A, we, we have created transportation improvement districts across our state where we basically partner with local land use agencies, 
to take a geographic area, determine parcel by parcel what they want it to quote unquote grow up to be, do actual traffic impact studies on that area to say, here's what improvements are needed in the next 20 to 30 years, and then assign basically a value to all of those projects. The development community then has certainty when they come in and they know exactly what improvements are going to happen. They're able to contribute to them and then ultimately those will become our capital projects uh, to get done. And so that's just another way that we're trying to kind of maximize because we know we can't do it on our own. And we know that a lot of these projects are adding uh, traffic to, um, to, to roadways. And so trying to get some benefits from them up front. And I think everything is a partner collaboration. Obviously one agency, you can't do it all on your own. It takes a whole team to be able to run this program. So moving on to the next, and I see that we have a couple of audience questions coming in. So keep having those questions come in. We will answer those at the end of the presentation. So I'll move on. And the next is how are we use it, utilizing our current resources effectively? So um, I know, Shanti, you talked about how right now you're not seeing a lot of labor shortages. I don't know, Kayla, if you've kind of witnessed labor shortages, but how exactly are we utilizing the resources that we currently have right now to move on with your capital programs more efficiently? And Kayla, I'll start with you. Yeah, so we've had a big push um, in trying to maintain our data so that um, we're not um, constantly having to um, we can update plans rather than start over. So making information available to share with other groups and having the ability to um, have that tool as a means of communication has really helped provide um, efficient management of resources and the ability to progress um, projects and uh, capital planning further for us. And then Shante, how is Delaware currently utilizing the resources that you have more efficiently? Sure. And I should uh, clarify. So when I said no labor shortages, I was talking more on the contracting side of things. <laughs> on the you know internal, uh, it, it is it is a struggle right now. We are at um, I think our average vacancy rate across the entire department is either 15 or 16 percent, which is much higher than it had been just a few years ago. Um, and then when you look at specific classifications like engineers, we're at 17 percent. Um, our technicians are above 20 percent. And so we we are having to be very um, thoughtful in how we're using folks. Um, and so, uh, you know, to, to your first bullet, we are um, lucky, if you will. Um, that we do have a lot of technical and engineering um, folks in leadership within our agency. Um, and while our secretary isn't necessarily an engineer, she definitely has an analytical mind um, and, and understands and listens, uh, listens to us um, as we're providing kind of that expertise. Um, the project scopes are really important. And again, trying to make sure that they're in alignment with our mission. But I will say that Bill kind of introduced some new um, criteria that we weren't necessarily using um, using a ton. When you look at resiliency, that wasn't something that we were kind of rating our projects on. We were doing some work in the equity space, but not as much as I think you know Bill has now pushed us to do. And so having to try and make adjustments along the fly is really uh, important. And then automation, and we'll talk I think about technology next, but. Um, there are a ton of things that we're doing in that space to make sure that we're using our resources effectively. Um, one that I'll share right now, so uh, e-ticketing, we were the first DOT in the country to kind of jump in both feet with e-ticketing. Um, why did we do that? Because it's silly to have inspectors standing there and collecting uh, hot mix tickets um, you know, while, hot, while paving operations are going on. And it's silly that some of those tickets would sometimes go missing and the amount of effort that folks were you know, using to do all that when we now have a system from the uh, you know, plant that is, you know, is electronically sending us those tickets. So we have the information so that we can pay the contractor um, you know, for that, uh, that, you know, that paving that has been done in a more expedited manner. Everything kind of works out from an audit trail. Um, and so that's kind of one thing, which then gives the inspector the ability to do what we actually need them to do, which is make sure that uh, things are being you know, installed properly into our specifications. So that's just one example of something that we've done where we've taken you know, what has been done for decades and you know, changed how it's being done to automate it a little bit more. Yeah, and you did mention that right now there's a couple of changes in the bill where 
you have to be able to make those changes, like you said, on the fly. And I think that's a whole other topic that we can discuss in another panel discussion is the updates that have been done to the bill because the bill was signed, I want to say, back in 2021. But then with inflation and all the changes, like you said, we had to be in charge of equity, but now it's resilience with all natural disasters happening. How resilient is your infrastructure? So it's one thing that everyone can take from here is there's always going to be change and we have to be open to change and being open to make those changes as they come. And I think a big thing of how to use your resources effectively is definitely utilizing the right technology. And we'll jump into the next presentation. And I think automation is going to help make use of your current employees that you have now. If you automate everything, it just makes it a lot easier. So I'll pass it over to you, Shante, since you were discussing about technology. How has technology helped or if not made it more difficult to run your capital programs? Sure. I think I think there it's twofold. I think it helps more than it hurts, but it can be painful kind of getting through the process. So I talked about e-ticketing. Uh, thankfully, um, we had uh, great collaboration with our stakeholders. So I talked about, uh, you know, paving. So the Asphalt Paving Association, they had to be on board with it. Our contractors needed to be on board with it. Internally, we had to have folks on board with it and kind of, you know, training them up. And so it can be successful, but there's definitely kind of that those growing pains and making sure that you're doing all of the work up front um, so that you've had those meaningful conversations, worked through any, you know, potential challenges and had, you know, been able to mitigate them. Uh, the other thing we're doing is digital project delivery. So um, we're last year was really when we started uh, being more focused on this. So you know our our team crews have been you know doing 3D modeling for years, but not sharing it with contractors. And so you know because they were afraid because what if something's wrong in there? And it's like well if it's wrong in there, it's wrong on the plans too, guys. <laughs> like they're, I don't know why you're so worried. And so really pushing them to say we're going to start giving them if we're doing a 3D model, we're going to give it to them. And, you know, that information is helpful to everybody. And if there's a if there's an issue that they find, whether it be during bidding or afterwards, it's not really a problem. It's highlighting something so that we can find a solution. Um, and so getting uh, getting more into digital delivery and figuring out how to transition our program to be kind of fully digital and get rid of the paper that we're using um, is one of our focus areas. And I think the, the other thing is alternative contracting. Um, it's not necessarily a technology, but using the contractors uh, and their expertise, uh, especially we've been doing construction manager, general contractor, as well as design build uh, to kind of ha focus on those constructability issues, identifying them using you know technology like clash detection to see where there might be utility and drainage conflicts, um, but using the contractor's knowledge to help us deliver better projects um, and using the technology we have to do that. Yeah, no, definitely agree. And Kayla, I'll pass it over to you because I know you were a program manager and you did work a lot with technology. So it was figuring those ad hoc solutions. So how has technology helped you or not helped you in other words? Yes, so as Shantae mentioned, um, um, when there's so many other uh, demands going on of your capital program and projects, um, often it's difficult to find the time to implement new solutions. So um, how do we carve out the space to slow down and understand what we have, um, uh, take stock and understand what assets we have to manage um, so that we can speed up in the future to answer our questions? So um, really, I think it comes down to um, um, having the tools and data available that um, you're able to share that effectively communicates um, the issues at hand. So um, understanding what data is important, that, important and how to share that with your stakeholders and your internal teams um, to find the best solution and mitigate your risks overall. Yeah, and I think it's finding those solutions, but also getting out of those growing pains, like both of you ladies mentioned, where it's the implementation process. But once you get through that and once everyone's on the same page, it makes it a lot easier. And just being in the industry long enough and learning about how agencies work, I still find it mind blowing that there's still paper trails running this programs when I'm like, everything should be 
automated. So I think that's a key takeaway. It's definitely utilize the right technology to help with your programs. Um, and that is the end of our presentation. And I know we have a couple of questions coming in. So Corey, I'll hand it over to you and let you run those com or questions. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so Kayla, Shante, you, you both talked about, um, about grants earlier on. Uh, so we have kind of a two-part question. How much of your program is spent on grant application pursuits and support? And can you share any tips on how you've been successful uh, in grant opportunities? Can I open that up to, to both of you. Um, I'm happy to start off, Shante, perhaps you have a more detailed approach to grants, whereas um, with my program, um, and oftentimes it's um, a little bit more ad hoc and uh, sometimes at the discretion and the resources available to the program manager to identify those grant resources and apply to them. So if in your pro in the program plan, it's so important to have um, dedicated time and resources and a plan to um, go after those grant opportunities. Um, otherwise, it's just so easy to miss it in, in the rest of your program that you're managing. So making sure that um, you're updating your own program planning work to stay aware. Um, and oftentimes, um, you don't get additional budget to go after those funds. You just kind of have to squeeze it in and make it work. Agreed, Kayla. So I, I think uh, I have a couple of thoughts on this. So first, now that bill is out and we have you know kind of a schedule for when certain grants uh, are you know nofos are going to come out it's much easier for us to plan for them now and so we're trying to be very thoughtful and kind of proactive to say here are the grant opportunities here's you know the high level things that we know about them within our capital program which projects may apply so that's kind of our forward approach uh, or moving forward approach i would say when bill first happened and even pre-bill um, it was very ad hoc. Uh, we'd see the NOFO come out. We'd look at our capital program and be like, all right, I think this project might work and, you know, throw resources at it, whether it be consultant resources or in-house resources to develop the application. Um, I, I said on the transit side, we've been very successful. Um, and so I don't know if the eight FTA grants are just easier to do, if our teams that have been working on those have just been amazing, but we've been very successful on that side. We've had some successes on what I would call the FHWA side of those grants, but not as many. Um, and so one uh, a tip that I would give folks is if you're submitting grants and you're, and they're, you're not getting awarded, do the debrief. Um, we've just recently done debriefs for both RAISE and INFRA. Super eye-opening, um, very helpful. There are rubrics within the NOFOs, and that's actually what they use to score all the applications. <laughs> and RAISE and INFRA are very different in how they score them and what they're looking for. And when they you know, are looking at the uh, benefit cost uh, ratio, all of those types of things. So I would, I thought that it was, uh, I, I thought I wasn't gonna gain much by doing the debriefs. And we finally were like, let's just do some debriefs. We'll spend an hour you know, on these two projects and see what happens. Extremely insightful. And I think it's going to uh, help us significantly. Um, in terms of how much of our program is spent on them, so, um, you know, we're spending tens of thousands of dollars typically to put together these grant applications. In some cases, it's as much as $50,000. We are focusing our grant applications on projects that are already in our capital plan. So we're just trying to pull things forward. So we are not saying like, oh, in our long range plan, we have this project that we were thinking about. Let's ask for a grant for it. No, we're doing projects that we have a decent amount of uh, work done on already. And so um, we, so it's not that we're trying to necessarily find new money. And on the transit side of the house, we would have had to do a bus purchase anyway. And now we're doing a zero emission bus purchase instead of, you know, a, a diesel bus purchase. And so, um, you know, we already had some, some funding program for those types of things. That's great. And I, I think one of the things that you just mentioned on, on your existing projects and, and kind of focusing on grants for those, um, leads into another question that we've gotten, which is, what is your decision framework for project prioritization? Are you able to share a little bit about that with us? Happy to. Uh, so two pieces. So um, it talks about state of good repair. So that's 
a different process than we use for what we call our standalone project. So for state of good repair, um, obviously we all had to have uh, transportation asset management plans. Um, and so we've been uh, going down that journey for a while. Um, but even before that, on the pavement and bridge uh, in particular, we have um, very specific uh, kind of processes to rate, you know, in terms of condition, to look at deterioration models, um, identifying kind of, and then looking overall at our uh, at all of those assets to say, here's our performance measure. When are we going to have problems if we're not putting forth, you know, a certain amount of uh, funding each year to those? And so, very kind of detailed analytical process for that. Similar on the standalone project side, um, we use a technology called Decision Lens uh, to do um, our prioritization. So we've gone through, created the criteria, created uh, scoring, if you will, related to each criteria, and then we kind of run every project through there. It gets a, a score and gets ranked. And then uh, independently, we're then looking at funding, availability and types of funding and pairing that with the rankings. And that ultimately leads to how projects are added to our capital uh, program. Um, on the bike ped side, we have a similar prioritization process. Um, it's not run through any specific kind of technology, um, but we're doing that on bike ped projects, uh, resiliency projects, we're creating uh, a similar process. So we try to be very data driven um, because it's easy if you're not data driven for other folks to tell you what your priorities are and which projects you should be working on. And so because we have kind of a pretty ironclad system, uh, we don't get those pressures to add things kind of out of sequence of where we are. If you're asking me to do something new, I need to put it through the prioritization process. It needs to come to me through an MPO or one of the counties. And, you know, once we rank it, then we see what kind of funding and typically new projects aren't getting funded until kind of years four five and six of our capital plan. So we have a pretty detailed process. Um, if you go to dell.gov um, and uh, search for capital transportation program, it actually outlines the whole process and how we do the scoring and ranking. And then Kayla, I'll pass that, that same question over to you. Yeah, I can speak on programmatic prioritization. Um, for example, um, when identifying locations for our bathroom break spaces for our operators, um, um, currently we have partnerships or leases or other facilities um, as well as standalone facilities that we utilize to provide restrooms. Um, and during COVID, we saw a lot of spaces close. So um, trying to identify how to um, ensure in the future that we have access to restrooms helps prioritize where we'll need additional resources, um, whether it be uh, more time spent finding partnership opportunities or doing a new capital, standalone capital project um, for a bathroom facility. So as Shantae mentioned, having data backed um, decisions and information about the project really allows you to um, create a strong project justification for your program. And um, that helps um, give direction to the program overall, but also um, um, raise raise the need to leadership and advocate for your program in terms of um, priority and where it stands in the agency overall. Fantastic. Um, so Shante, you mentioned earlier that you, know, you have um, openings of, of 15, even up to 20% in, in some roles. Do you find that the people that are in the role are, are being pulled and asked to do more than they traditionally would or outside of their scope of work? And if so, how are, are you dealing with that? Certainly, I think we're all doing more than um, if you look maybe 20 years ago, what, what folks were doing. Uh, traditionally, if you were an engineer, you did X, Y, and Z, and you didn't do you know these other things. And now, you're kind of having to do a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, trying to give our folks adequate training is important, um, trying to make sure that they understand that, yes, the, the whole project is yours and it, you don't just have one piece. You're really in charge of all of it and the relationships that you need to develop with folks to, to get things done are really important. Um, 
and then trying to, you know, we, we are using a lot of uh, consultant resources to, to help us deliver our program. And so, um, you know, training folks to adequately, you know, manage uh, those, those types of uh, projects where it's a little bit, you know, of a different uh, role that you're uh, serving in. But yes, um, our engineers have to know financial things. They have to do administrative tasks. They're having to learn different technologies. Um, they're doing all of those things. And, uh, you know, I think giving them the training is important, uh, supporting them and understanding if, if it's too much. Um, I often, you know, we have some uh, vacancies in some of our kind of first level manager um, uh, positions. And so the folks that, you know, are above that position are now having to do some of those duties. And so I will go and check in with folks and say, you know, are you good? Are you getting burned out? What can I do to, to help you? Um, so I think checking in with people and letting them know that you care. Um, we have, you know, because of COVID, we had uh, some of our, a small percentage of our team that uh, did get to telecommute full time for a period of time. Um, we did bring everybody back to the office and now you can telecommute a max of two days per week. Um, we have alternative work schedules. One of the cool ones that our state HR actually came up with was a windowed schedule. So you come into the office at say normal time, but you may leave at 2 p.m. so you can get your kids off of the bus and help them get their homework done. And then you log back on at say, you know, 4 or 5 p.m. and finish your work day. And so I think, you know, trying to be creative um, with how, how we deal with folks, but still holding them accountable because there are some people that don't have that luxury and have to come to the office every day. And so that balance um, is, is one that we've tried to strike. Yeah, I think that that flexibility is incredibly important. Obviously, so many things changed over the last couple of years, and it, it kind of became a, a, a way of life. So it's it's great that you're providing that flexibility and that windowed schedule for your team members. Um, Kayla, what about on the the transit level? What are what were what are you seeing there? Um, in my programs, I've been. Uh, we did a lot to communicate with each other, uh, best practices to understand what is and what is not working and how we can support each other as well. Um, um, when you're looking at these major, huge capital programs um, and trying to respond to budget requests um, for the project and programs, it, become, it can become, and it is extremely daunting. So um, providing, um, uh, support to others and you know um, allowing others to support you as well uh, so be able to communicate your needs um, and share those resources with others and then also um, flexible working schedules and times um, as Shantae mentioned um, and then being sure that um, to set meeting times with other program managers that um, are effective and um, are able to strategize the issues that you're coming up against as well has been really helpful for us in um, trying to manage all of our uh, requirements together. Yeah, that's great. I think you know collaborating with people that are, are very effective in certain areas is is incredibly important, and, and it's a really good learning opportunity for you to to go out and learn those best practices and, and you know start start making them a part of your own day-to-day -day life. Absolutely. Um, I think that covers it from the question. So Stephanie, I will pass it back over to you. Thank yeah, you, well, Shantae and Kayla. Yeah, thanks to everyone. Thank you to all the members of our audience. And we will be hosting these webinars on a monthly basis. So definitely be on the lookout. And once again, thank you. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your afternoon from whatever state or region you're visiting us from and have a great rest of the day. Bye everybody.